Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to worship on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. As always, good of you to be joining us for this two or three worship media. It is hard to believe, but we're already at the end of October. And with that, we are going to be moving, of course, very, very quickly through the month of November, through December, and to the end of the year. And so I wanted to bring to your attention a couple of sermon series that we've got coming up. Next week, of course, is the traditional Sunday, the last Sunday of October, when we celebrate the reforming work that Martin Luther and others did within the Christian church. And so we've got a special Reformation Sunday plan surrounding the topic of soul. We're going to look at this only concept and how that's influenced the Lutheran Christian tradition. We've got All Saints Sunday following that. And then beginning November 8th, we're going to go into a multi-week series called The Lost Art of Gratitude. And that will actually take us through Thanksgiving. So looking forward to sharing those messages and that part of God's word with you as we get into uh, October and November. Also, just a reminder that we've got youth group, and that is back. We are joining up with Emmaus, with Jehovah, and with King of Kings Lutheran. So we've got a good group of young people who are getting together and... On Thursday, October 29th, beginning at 5.30, we are joining over at the Coon Rapids location of Feed My Starving Children. A little bit of pizza, some cider to start with, and then we'll go in and bless some kids around the world by getting food out to them. If you'd like to sign up for that, you can go on to our website, www.bethelsaintpaul.com, and you will find sign-up and registration forms there. If you have any questions, as always, contact myself or Elena in the office We'll always be glad to help direct you in the right place. With that, I'll invite you to center your hearts and quiet your thoughts as we prepare for worship. We begin this morning as we always do, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. Yet for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us graciously. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your gracious will, and only by your gracious will, we've been justified, made right with you through Jesus Christ alone. And now, saved from death, our old sinful selves drowned through the waters of baptism, you've raised us up to new life. With eternal life through Christ, a promised reality, we now live out our daily lives sanctified, increasingly according to your will. 
As long as we live in this broken world, this process will never be complete. It is no quick fix. But because you are forever faithful and because you've given us the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit, we live these lives in confident trust in and service to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have one reading from the scriptures on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost, and that is the third chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, grace you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Where do you want to be in five years? Take a moment to think about that. Five years from now, 2025, where do you want to be? What do you want to have accomplished by that time? Do you want to maybe be debt free in five years? Maybe the car you're driving is going to be tired, worn out, and by then you want to have a new vehicle. Maybe in five years, you want to have your kids in college or maybe through college. Where do you want to be? What is your life going to look like in five years, in 2025? To look at that differently, think back to 2015. And have you gotten to a place now 
where five years ago you hoped to get to. Just for some perspective, think back to 2015. What was going on then? You may recall, sadly, that 2015 was the year that terrorists burst into the offices of that satirical magazine in France, a uh, magazine called Charlie Hebdo. That was 2015. 2015 had David Letterman hosting the last of his evening programs that he'd been hosting for some 33 years. 2015 was the year that the New England Patriots won the Super Bowl for like the 5,000th time. But 2015 was the year that they beat the Seattle Seahawks. That was five years ago. Now think about all the things that have happened in your life since those events occurred back in 2015. And are you at a place today where back then you hoped you would be? Where do you want to be in five years? And are you at a place today where you hoped you would be? Where do you want to be in 2025? And the question is how are you going to get there? And if thinking ahead five years is too much of a daunting task, let's take that in a little bit of a smaller bite and switch the question a little bit. Instead of where do you want to be in five years, think about this. Where do you want to be in five hours? What are you going to be doing five hours from now? Or what do you hope to have accomplished by then? Put differently, how far can you go? How far can you travel in five hours? The interesting thing is, is that most of us can cover 26.2 miles in about five hours or just a little bit more. That is to say that most of us could complete a marathon in five hours. And how would we do that? Well, a little bit of training plus literally just putting one foot in front of another. And with those two things, most of us could complete 26.2 miles of walking, jogging, running, a combination of the three in just about five hours. Planning, dreaming, aligning, these are the kinds of things that we do with all sorts of parts of our lives. We do it for our homes in terms of the things we want to get fixed. We do it for how we're going to manage our debt and eliminate the debt that we have. We do it for what we hope for our kids and how we want to get them going in the next stage of their lives. We do it for vacations. We plan, we dream, we look ahead far off into the future and we align what we're doing now with what we want to become. We do these things all the time for these kinds of things. And the question for today is, what about our faith? How far into the future do you think about where you're going to be in five years in terms of being a follower of Jesus Christ? Which brings us to the Apostle Paul. His contribution to the Christian church was so significant. And his call, his conversion to the Christian faith was so dynamic that I think what we have a tendency to do when it comes to Paul is we tend to look at him in an overly simplistic way, much like this statue is just the most simple depiction of who Paul is. When we think about the Apostle Paul, Paul is one of those characters from our Christian faith who's done so much, he accomplished so much, he literally covered so much ground over the course of his ministry that we have a tendency to kind of think of him in one way an overly simplistic way that he is one of these superheroes of the Christian faith. And yet, once Paul was converted to faith in Jesus Christ, he didn't immediately become a super-Christian. The call that Paul received on the road going from Jerusalem to Damascus is a dynamic part of Paul's story. But I think we have a tendency, once we get that conversion in Damascus, we have a tendency to think of Paul as all of a sudden now being the superhero of faith, which is not true. The process for Paul to become who we know him to be took time. The process for Paul to become who we know him to be took training. It literally took Paul putting one foot in front of the other 
in order to be the person who wrote half of the New Testament and who we know him to be. How did Paul become who we know him to be? And the answer to that question, he offers to us in the middle of this third chapter of the book of Philippians. Verse 12, Paul says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And within that one verse, there is a ton of good stuff for us to consider and to be blessed by in terms of how did Paul become this champion of Christian faith that we know him to be. And what Paul is describing in just that 12th verse is something that in the church we call sanctification. Sanctification is a big church word that literally means the process of conforming our lives to God's will. Put differently, sanctification is the training that we do in order to make our will align more with God. Paul describes sanctification in the reading that we have today in much the same way that a marathon is run. Verses 13 and 14, Paul says, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It sounds a lot like running a road race. You're running along, you've gotten to a point where you're already a little bit tired. You're not thinking about the ground you've already covered. What you're now doing is focused on the ground that lies ahead. And you're pressing on toward the goal of finishing that race. This is how Paul imagines and describes his process of sanctification. He doesn't think about what has come before. He strains toward what lies ahead. And he presses on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Make no mistake about it. You're running the race of faith. You're straining along the road of faith. That running cannot make you right with God. Much like a long road race, if running and straining is what makes us right with God, just like this picture here, if it's by our own power, we will eventually hit a wall. And once we hit that wall, when all of the energy is out of our body, when we're parched, when we're starving, when we don't think we can take another step, if it's based on our own power, what will happen? We'll stop right there in the middle of the road. We won't take another step. We can't do it. And so make no mistake about it. Our running the race is not the thing that makes us right with God at all. When it's based on our own power, we hit a wall. What makes us right with God is something that in the Christian church we call justification. And justification is a fancy way of saying that we're made right with God only because of what Jesus Christ has first done for us. We can't make ourselves right with God. We have been made right with God only because of what Jesus did for us by going to the cross enduring the tomb, and rising triumphantly from it on Easter Sunday. That's what makes us right with God. But now that we've been made right with God because of everything that Jesus has done, that's when sanctification comes in. And what sanctification does is it changes who we are. It changes our attitude, it changes our behavior, it changes the way we think, to more and more become Christ-like, which is the exact same thing as what God wants to have happen. It's the same thing as God's will. And so where justification in Jesus makes us right with God, sanctification aligns us more and more with what God wills because of what he did first through Jesus. That process of sanctification, though, takes time. That process of sanctification takes patience. It takes planning. It's much the same way that we would train to do any activity that we want to do well, running chiefly among them. 
And so what is the process that we go through in order to more and more conform our will to the will of God? That is to say, what does that training look like in order for us to more and more conform to the will that God has for us? Well, the first thing we need to do is understand what it is that motivates us. What is it that gets us onto the road of faith in the first place? And what allows us, what motivates us to put one foot in front of the other? And this is where the law and the gospel come in. The gospel is the thing that moves me to action in the first place. And the law still becomes a part of that equation because what the law does is it conforms me to God's will. Paul talks about this in verses 1 and 2 this morning. Follow God's example, Paul says, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us. The gospel is the thing that makes us want to get into godly action in the first place. And that's found right here, just as Christ loved us. Christ loved me, even when I didn't deserve it, especially when I didn't deserve it. Christ loved me. That's a motivator. That makes me want to do something because I don't merit it, because I don't deserve it. And now what happens is the law comes in, and it kind of guides me and shepherds me along that gospel path. Follow God's example. What's God's example? Well, God's example is perfect. God's example is exactly the way he wants it. Can I do that? No. As long as I'm living here on earth, I won't be able to do that perfectly. But that doesn't mean that the example isn't the benchmark that I'm trying to follow. And the only way that I can do it is because the gospel moves me to action in the first place. Do you see what I'm saying? What motivates us is a balance between God's law, which gives us the boundaries to stay within, and the gospel that moves us into action in the first place. That's the first thing to be aware of, is that what motivates us to action is what Paul talks about here in verses 1 and 2. The second thing is to use the training tools that God has already given to us. And when it comes to the training tools that we have for these races of faith, for this marathon of faith, God has given us all kinds of gifts to be able to help us. And we call those in the Lutheran Christian tradition, we call those training tools means of grace. And the means of grace that God has given us are things like our baptism, Holy Communion. Baptism is a tool that God has given to us. In fact, it's a big, big tool because it is the means by which God has joined us to Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And what we do then throughout the rest of our lives is we go back to our baptism. Every single day we're invited to go back to our baptism to be reminded of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and to join us to him in a very real way through that water that we experience one time through the fun. Holy Communion is something that we enjoy periodically, a couple times a month. And in Holy Communion, God gives us this incredible gift of grace. This is not merely a metaphor. God is not saying, here's bread and here's wine, but that's all it is. No. Christ says, this is my body. Not this is like my body. This is my body. And we don't understand completely how it's possible that Christ wants to and does join himself to bread and wine. But he does. Think about it this way, my friends. Just as much as you believe that Christ truly is there, is active and he hears you when you pray. Christ joins himself in a real way to bread and wine. And he does it as a means to nourish you, to refresh you along your race of faith. Use that tool. Relish that tool. If you've ever run a race, there are places along the path where there are people, maybe with an energy bar, with a bottle of water. Holy Communion, my friends, is that on your race of faith. It's that spot where you can pause 
to be refreshed during your race of faith. And so use that. Take advantage of it because that's what God wants to give you. Other means of grace that God gives to us. Bible study. I'm a part of a small group here at Bethel. I don't lead it. We've got another member of our congregation who's gracious enough to do that. What I'm immeasurably blessed by is this group meets every Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock. To be able to start every Wednesday in God's Word with a few other guys from our congregation. But then this week, to be struck in a profound way about a story that I've heard hundreds of times, but never thought of before. We were talking about Abraham and Isaac and that whole story about Abraham being called to sacrifice Isaac and God stayed his hand. As we were sitting there studying that story, the story I know, backwards, upside down, something about God's word hit me in a way and showed me something that I had never, ever seen before. I'll tell you what it is real quickly. We're told in Genesis that as Abraham and Isaac are walking up the hill to supposedly offer the sacrifice, Isaac is carrying wood on his shoulders. Fast forward hundreds of years into the future. Isaac is going to be sacrificed. He's got wood on his shoulders. Hundreds of years in the future, who carried wood on his shoulders and actually was sacrificed for us? I never, ever made that connection before in my life. It is because of this training tool, because of this means of grace of being able to gather with people on a weekly basis and study God's Word that I find myself immeasurably blessed. Use it. Prayer cannot underestimate the importance of prayer as a way of training, of staying connected to the very God who's called you on this race of faith. So use those training tools. God gives them to us in abundant supply. They are there for you to use. The third thing, understand that you are doing the running and that by doing the running, you are going to find yourself very, very tired at times. This race of faith that we've been called to be a part of is not something that's going to be easy. And it's not something that someone else can do for you. Now that Jesus Christ has saved you, now we are called to go out and do that. We are called to race on those roads of faith. The thing is, we're doing the running, and we are going to get very tired. One of the challenges sometimes is that I hear people say, you know, I thought this was going to be easier. No. Being a person of Christian faith can be an incredibly difficult thing. And there are times where you are absolutely tired and exhausted beyond compare. But that's where number four steps in. You are not running that race alone, my friend. Even though you are running the race, even though you are expending the energy and you will be tired, you are not alone. Just as a lot of people are blessed by having a training partner who goes with them and works out and helps them to get better, you have a training partner in all of this, and better yet, you have actually his power upon which to draw as you're training and as you're being sanctified. So recognize that you are not doing this alone. Paul talks about this very thing in verses 12 and 13 when he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There is the part where you are going to get very tired. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not for the faint of heart, and it's not easy. And yet, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. There's your training partner. There's the very power that you need to be able to put one foot in front of the other on this path of faith. It's not you who has to do it by yourself, but it's God who works in you to do what? 
to will and to act in the way he is calling you to will and to act. Fourth thing, recognize, my friends, that as long as you are living these earthly lives, your sanctification will never be perfect. You'll never get it 100% right. You'll never be able to do it exactly how God's will aligns you to do it. Your training is never complete. Paul talks about this in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. Paul would be the first one to tell you that he doesn't get it all right. And yet we consider Paul to be one of the greatest examples of Christian faith that's ever lived. As long as you're living this earthly life, you will always be trained. It'll never be perfect. But yet we keep our eyes on the finish line. No matter how imperfect it is, no matter how many times we stumble, stub our toe in the middle of that road, we always keep our eyes ahead. Remember what Paul said, we don't look at what is behind us, we keep our eyes focused and we keep striving ahead. And by looking at the finish line, what are we talking about? The finish line is not just heaven, although that's absolutely true. The finish line is God's glory. Everything we do is for God's glory and to his praise. Everything we do is to witness to what Jesus Christ has done for each of us specifically. Everything we do is about treating others in the same way that God has treated us through Jesus Christ. It's helping other people. It's assuring them that the faith that they cling to is not in vain, but it is that it is the most true thing that they can ever experience in the world. Where do you want to be in five years? And better yet, where do you want to be in five years? How are you going to get there? What do you need to do to align yourself and to plan? And maybe a more attainable question and goal than where do you want to be in five years is how far do you want to get in five hours? How far can you go in just a little less than a half dozen hours? And as important as anything, who will you take along for the run? Who will be your training partner? Who will be the source of power that you need to continue plodding along and putting one foot in front of the other? Paul begins to close this third chapter of Philippians with a bit of a warning. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame. With minds set on earthly things. If there was a contemporary phrase that Paul might use to sum up what he's talking about here, is there are people who are couch potatoes. There are people who look at the cross of Christ and say, eh, I ain't getting up. Their end is destruction, Paul warns. But then Paul shifts and he ends chapter 3 with a promise. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You can do this, my friend. This is a race that you have been called by your living God and Lord to run, and you can do it, not because of your own power, not because you want to do it, not because it's going to be easy, but because You've got him, and he will never stop running alongside of you, giving you his power to, to be able to bear faithful witness to everything he has first done for you on the cross and through the empty tomb. Run that race, my friends. You can do it because of him. 
You can do it always to His glory. The Lord be with you. Amen. And now, friends, let's confess our common Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. Heavenly Father, we give you a measurable and unending thanks for the gift of justification, for the gift of making us right with you only through the blood of Jesus Christ crucified and risen. But now that you have made us right through Jesus, we give you the same immeasurable and unending thanks for the gift of sanctification, for the gift of your Holy Spirit who empowers and aligns our human and broken wills to your eternal and perfect will. It's true. As long as we are a part of this broken and sinful world, this process will never be fully and perfectly completed. And yet we give you thanks for the opportunity and the partnership in training, in practicing and perfecting the alignment of our wills to yours. Help us, inspire us, bless each of us to increasingly be more perfected in this way. That our words, our deeds, our earthly lives may increasingly bear faithful and effective witness to you and to your Son who has made all of things right in the world. Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, as our country has the true blessing of being able to evaluate and appoint another justice to our Supreme Court this week, we pray for a few things in light of those proceedings. First, that your Holy Spirit would more perfectly inspire out of our elected representatives a more true attitude of humble service to our country. Amidst the grandstanding, the lecture, the posturing of United States Senators this week, we pray that all of these who are privileged to be chosen to represent us as citizens will increasingly do just that. Serve, legislate, humbly, and in deference to you first, and then to our country's constitution. Second, as Judge Coney Barrett has sat this week and given account for her judicial record, as have all other Supreme Court candidates before her, we pray that your Holy Spirit will increasingly prepare, solidify our beliefs and temper our responses to be able to similarly give an account to those who inquire about why we believe in your Son. As you do for these candidates, so give us the reason, the wisdom, and the temperament to be able to give righteous answer for the faith we have in Jesus Christ that all others, if not moved to actual faith in him, cannot find fault in our reason or tone of our response. Finally, with Judge Coney Barrett in the forefront of our minds this week, we are right to specifically give you thanks for the service of the men and women of this land who minister through the judicial branch of our federal, state, and local government you gave to Solomon hundreds and hundreds of years ago, so we pray that you give these saints the same level of wisdom and discernment to rightly adjudicate the debates and problems set before them. Bless 
all of those, including Judge Coney Barrett, who serve on the benches of this most blessed country. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, in the wake of flood and fire around our country, we continue to lift you those saints who are suffering along with those continuing to protect and serve them around the clock. Continue to work through any means necessary and any good necessary to give these suffering and these servants all that they need to meet this new week ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We now pause from the silence of our own hearts to lift you others who have been occupying them this week. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, Almighty God, we give back to you all that we've prayed for, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor, and may he give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.